Crime and Punishment, Part 2, Subsection 5. This was a gentleman already well past his youth, prim, stately, with a wary and peevish, peevish, peevish physiognomy, who began by stopping in the doorway and glancing about with offensively unconcealed astonishment, as if asking with his eyes, Where on earth have I come to? Mistrustfully, and even with a pre pretense of being somewhat alarmed, even while almost affronted, he looked around Raskolnikov's cramped and low ship's cabin, after which, with some astonishment, he shifted his gaze and fixed it upon Raskolnikov himself, undressed, unkempt, unwashed, lying on his me meager and dirty sofa, who was also staring motion motionlessly at him. Then, with the same deliberateness, he began sta staring at the disheveled, uncombed, unshaven figure of Razumikin who, with insolent inquisitiveness, looked him straight in the eye, not moving from where he sat. The tense silence lasted for about a minute, then at last, as might be expected, a slight change of scene took place. The newly arrived gentleman must have realized, from certain, albeit rather sharp, indications, that in this in this ship's cabin, his exaggerate, exaggeratedly stern bearing would get him precisely nowhere, and, softening somewhat, he turned and addressed Zosimov, politely, though not without sternness, wrapping out each syllable of his question. Mr. Rodion Romanich Raskolnikov, a student, or a former student, Zosimov slowly stirred himself and would perhaps have answered if Radzumikin, who had not been addressed at all, had not immediately prevented him. He's here, lying on the sofa. What is it you want? This offhanded, what is it you want, simply floored the prim gentleman. He even almost turned to Radzimikin, but managed to catch himself in this in time and quickly turned back to Zosimov. This is Raskolnikov, Zosimov drawled, nodding towards the sick man, and he yawned, opening his mouth extraordin extraordinarily wide as he did so, and kept it that way for an extraordinarily long time. Then he slowly drew his hand up to his waist pocket, took out an, Im an enormous convex gold lidden watch, gold lidded watch and opened it opened it looked and slowly and sluggishly put it back into his pocket raskolnikov himself lay silently on his back all the while staring obstinately though without any thought at the man who had come in his face now turned away from the curious flower of the wallpaper was extremely pale and had a look of had a look of extraordinary suffering of, as though he had just undergone painful surgery or had just been released from torture but the newly arrived gentleman gradually began to elicit more and more attention from him, then perplexity, then mistrust, then even something like fear. And when Zosimov, pointing to him, said, This is Raskolnikov, he suddenly raised himself quickly, as if jumping up a little, sat up on his bed, and spoke in an almost defiant but faltering and weak voice. Yes, I'm Raskolnikov. What do you want? The visitor looked at him attentively and said imposingly, Piotr Petrovich Luzin, I have every hope that by now my name is not wholly unfamiliar to you. Damn, this is the first encounter. It's going to be good. But Raskolnikov, who had been expecting something quite different, looked at him dully and pensively and made no reply, as though he were decided, decidedly hearing Piotr Petrovich's name for the first time. What, is it possible that you have received no news as yet? Piotr Petrovich asked, wincing slightly. In response to Raskolnikov slowly, in response to which Raskolnikov slowly sank back on the pillow, flung his hands up behind his head and began staring at the ceiling. Anguish flitted across Luzin's face. Zosimov and Radzimikin began scrutinizing him with even greater curiosity, and he finally became visibly embarrassed. I had supposed and reckoned, he began to draw, that a letter sent more than ten days ago, almost two weeks in fact, Listen, why do you go on standing in the doorway? Ratsumikin suddenly interrupted. If you got something to explain, do sit down. There's not room enough there for both you and Nastasia. Step aside, Nastayushka. Let him pass. Come in, there's a chair for you right here. Squeeze by. He pushed, he pushed his chair back from the table, made a small space between the table and his knees, and waited in somewhat strained position, in that somewhat strained position for the visitor to squeeze through the crack. The moment was chosen in such a way that it was quite impossible to refuse, and the visitor started through the narrow space, hurrying and stumbling. Having reached the chair, he sat down and eyed Radzumikin suspiciously. Anyway, you aren't be embarrassed. 
Rodzimikin blurted out. It's the fifth day that Rodia's been sick. For three days he was delirious, but now he's come to and even got his appetite back. Here sits his doctor. He's just finishing he's, he's just finished examining him. And I'm Rod Rodka's friend, also a former student, and presently his nurse, so you oughtn't to con to count us or be confused. But just go ahead and say what it is you want. Thank you. But shall I not disturb the sick man with my pres presence and conversation? Pyotr Petrovich turned to Zosimov. No, Zosimov drawled. You may even divert him. And he yawned again. Oh, he's been conscious for a long time, since morning, continued Razumikin, whose familiarity had the appearance of such unfeigned ingenu ingenuousness that Pyotr Petrovich reconsidered and began to take, his, to take heart, perhaps also partly because the insolent ragamuffin had 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 time to introduce himself as a student. Your mama, Luzin began. A loud <clears throat> came from Radzimikin. Luzin looked at him questioning, questioning me. Nothing, never mind, go on. Luzin shrugged. Your mama began a letter to you, myself being among them at the time. Having arrived here, I waited purposely for a few days before coming to see you, so as to be completely certain that you had been informed of everything. But now, to my surprise, I know, I know, Raskolnikov suddenly said, with an expression of the most impatient annoyance. That's you, is it? The fiancé. So, I know. And enough. Pyotr Petrovich, Pyotr Petrovich was decidedly hurt, but held, held his tongue. He hastened to try and understand what it all meant. The silence lasted for about a minute. Meanwhile, Raskolnikov, who had turned slightly towards him when he replied, suddenly began looking him over again attentively and with some special curiosity, as if he had not managed to look him over well enough before, or as if he had been struck by something new in him. He even raised himself from his pillow on purpose to do so. Indeed, there was something striking there was some striking peculiarity, as it were, in Pyotr Petrovich's general general appearance, namely something that seemed to justify the appellation of fiance. Just give him so un just given him so unceremoniously. First, it was evident, and even all too noticeable, that Pyotr Petrovich had hastened to try to use his few days in the capital to get himself fitted out and spruced up while waiting for his fiancée, which, incidentally, was quite innocent and pardonable. Even his own, perhaps, all too smug awareness of his pleasant change for the better could be forgiven on such an occasion, for Pyotr Petrovich did indeed rank as a fiancée. All his clothes were fresh from the tailor and even was fine, except perhaps that it was all too new and spoke overly much of a certain purpose. Even the smart, spanking new, top hat spanking new top hat testified this purpose. Pyotr Petrovich somehow treated it all too reverently and held it all too carefully in his hands. Even the exquisite pair of lilac-colored real Juvian gloves testified to the same thing. By this alone, that they were not worn by, they were not worn, but merely carried around for display. <laughs> in Pyotr Petrovich's attire, attire, light and youthful colors predominated. He was wearing a pretty summer jacket of a light brown shade, light-colored summer trousers, a matching waistcoat, a fine newly purchased shirt, a little tie of the lightest cambric with pink stripes, and the best part was that it, it all even became Pyotr Petrovich. His face, very fresh and very handsome, looked younger than his 45 years to begin with. Dark side whiskers pleasantly overshadowed it from both sides, like a pair of mutton chops, setting off very handsomely his gleaming, clean-shaven chin. Even his hair, only slightly touched with grey, combed and curled by the hairdresser, did not thereby endow him with a ri ridiculous or somehow silly look, as curled hair most often does, inevitably making one resemble a German on its way to the altar. And if there was indeed something unpleasant and repulsive in, his ra in, in this rather handsome and solid physiognomy, it proceeded from other causes. Having looked Mr. Luzin over unceremoniously, Raskolnikov smiled venomously, sank onto the pillow again, and went back to staring at the ceiling. But Mr. Luzin checked himself, and apparently decided to ignore all this strange strangeness for the time being. I am quite sorry to find you in such a state, he, he began again, breaking the silence with some effort. If I had known you were, were unwell, I would have come sooner. But you know, one gets caught up. Moreover, in my line as a lawyer, I have a rather important case in the Senate, not to mention those cares which you yourself may surmise. I'm expecting your relations, that is, your mama and sister, any time now. Raskolnikov stirred and wanted to say something. A certain agitation showed on his face. Pyotr Petrovich stopped and waited, but since nothing followed, he went on. Any time now. I found them an apartment for the immediate future. Where? Raskolnikov said, weakly. Quite near. 
in Bakalev's house. That's on Wozniewski. Wozniewski. Radzimikin interrupted. There are two floors of unfurnished rooms. The merchant Yush Yushin runs the place. I've been there. Yes, furnished rooms, sir. Utterly vile, filth, stench, and a suspicious place besides. Things have happened there, and devils no devil knows who the tenants are. I went there on a scandalous occasion myself, but <laughs> but it's cheap. I think this is Ratsumikin speaking. He's hilarious. Uh... I, of course, was not able to gather such so much information, being new here. Pyotr Petrovich object, objected touchily. But in any case, they are two quite quite clean room, clean little rooms. And since it is for quite a short period of time, I have already found a real, that is, our future apartment. He turned to Raskolnikov. And it is now being decorated. And I myself am squeezed into furnished rooms for the time being. Two steps away at Mr. Lipo Weschel's. In the apartment of a young friend of mine, Andrei Semin Semyonich Lebzenyatnikov. Lebz Lebezyatnikov. It was he who directed me to Bakalev's house. Lebezyatnikov? Raskolnikov said slowly, as if recalling something. Yes, Andrei Semyonich Lebezyatnikov, a clerk in the ministry. Do you know him? Do you know him perchance? Yes, no, Raskolnikov replied. Excuse me, but your question made it seem that you did. I once used to be his guardian, a very nice young man, up to date. I'm delighted to meet young people. One learns what, it, what is new from them. Pyotr Petrovich looked hopefully around at those present. In what sense do you mean? Radzimikin asked. In the most serious, so to speak, in the very essence of things, Pyotr Petrovich picked up as if delighted to be asked. You see, it has been ten years since I last visited Petersburg. All these new things, of course, reforms, ideas, all this has touched us in the provinces as well. But to see better and to see everything, one must be in Petersburg. Well, sir, it is precisely my notion that one sees and learns most of all by observing our younger generations. And I, can conf and I confess I am delighted. With, with what exactly? A vast question. I may be mistaken, but it seems to me I find a clearer vision, more criticism, so to speak, more practicality. That's not true, Zazimov said through his teeth. Nonsense, there's no practicality, Radzimikin seized upon him. Practicality is acquired with effort, it doesn't fall from the sky for free, and we lost the habit of, an acti of any activity about 200 years ago. There may be some ideas wandering around, he turned to Pyotr Petrovich, and there is a desire for the good, albeit a childish one. Even honesty can be found, though there are crooks all, all over the place, but still, there's no practicality. Practicality is a scant item these days. I cannot agree with you, Pyotr Petrovich objected with visible pleasure. Of course, there are passions, mistakes, but one must also make allowances. Passions testify to youth enthusiasm for the cause, and to the wrong ex external situation in which the cause finds itself. And if, and if little has in fact been done, there also has not been much time, not to mention means. But it is my personal view, if you like, that something has been done, useful new ideas have been spread, and some useful new books, instead of the former dreamy and romantic ones, literature is acquiring a shade of greater maturity. Many harmful prejudice, prejudices have been eradicated and derided. In short, we have cut ourselves in short, we have cut ourselves off irrevocably from the past, and that in itself, I think, is already something, sir. All by rote, recommending, recommending himself, Raskolnikov said suddenly. What, sir? asked Pyotr Petrovich, who had not caught the remark, but he received no reply. That is all quite correct, Zazimov hastened to put in. Is it not, sir? Pyotr, Pyotr Petrovich continued, glancing affably at Zazimov. You yourself must agree, he went on addressing Radzumikin, but not with the shade of a certain triumph but not with the shade of a certain triumph and superiority, and he almost added, young man, that there is such a thing as prosperity, or, as they now say, progress, if only in the name of science and economic truth. A commonplace? No, it is not a commonplace, sir. If up to now, for example, I have been told to love my neighbor, and I did love them, what came of it? Pyotr Petrovich continued, perhaps with unnecessarily past haste. What came out of it was that I tore my caftan in two, shared it with my neighbor, and we were both left half naked, in accordance with the Russian proverb which says, If you chase several hairs at once, you won't overtake any of them. But science says, Love yourself above all, before all, because everything in the world is based on self-interest. 
If you love yourself, if you love only yourself, you will set your affairs up properly, and your and your captain will also remain in one piece. And economic truth adds that the more properly arranged personal affairs are, personal affairs, and so to speak, whole captains there are in society, the firmer its foundations are, and the better arranged its common cause. It follows that by acquiring solely and exclusively for myself, I am thereby precisely acquiring for everyone, as it were, and working so that my neighbor will have something more than a torn captain, not from private, isolated generosities now, but as a result of universal pr prosperity. A simple thought, which unfortunately has been too long in coming, overshadowed by rapturousness and dreaminess, though it seems it would not take much wit to realize, sorry, wit is what I happen to lack, Radzimikin interrupted sharply. So let's stop. I did have some purpose when I started talking, but all of this self-gratifying chatter, this endless stream of commonplaces, and all the same, always the same, has become so sickening after three years that, by God, I blush not only to say such things, but to hear them said in my presence. Naturally, you've hastened to recommend yourself with regard to your knowledge. That is quite pardonable, and I do not commend, and I do not condemn, condemn it, condemn it. For the time being, I simply wanted to find out who you were, because, you know, there are all sorts of traffickers hanging up onto this common cause, who, in their own self-interest, have distorted everything they've touched and that they touched, that they have decidedly befouled the whole cause. And so, enough, sir! My dear sir, Mr. Lewison began, wincing with extreme dignity. Do you mean to suggest so unceremoniously that I, too— Oh, heavens, heavens! How could I? And so, enough, sir! Radzimikin cut, cut him off and turned abruptly to Zosimov to continue their previous conversation. Pyotr Petrovich proved intelligent enough to believe the explanation at once, but he resolved to leave in two minutes anyway. I hope that our acquaintance, which has presently begun, he turned to Raskolnikov, will open your will upon your recovery and in view of circumstances circumstances known to you, continue to grow. I wish especially that your health Raskolnikov did not even turn his head. Pyotr Petrovich began to get up from his chair his chair. The killer was certainly one of her clients, Zosimov was saying assertively. Certainly one of her clients, Verzumikin echoed. Porfiry doesn't give away his thoughts, but all the same he's interrogating the clients. Interrogating the clients, Raskolnikov asked loudly. Yes, what of it? Nothing. How does he get hold of them? asked Zosimov. Koch le has led them led him to some. The names of others were written on the paper the articles were wrapped in, and some came on their own when they heard. Must be a cunning and experienced rogue. What boldness, what determination. But he's not that. But he's not. That's precise, precisely the point, Radzimikin interrupted. That's what throws you all off. I say he was not cunning, not experienced, and this was certainly his first attempt. Assume cal calculation and a cunning rogue, and it all looks improbable. Assume an inexperienced man, and it looks as if he escaped disaster only by chance and chance can do all sorts of things good god maybe he didn't even foresee any obstacles and how does he go about the business business he takes things worth 10 or 20 rubles stuffs in his stuff his, stuffs his pockets with them rummages in a woman's trunk among her rags while in the chest and the top drawer in a strong box they found 15 <laughs> hundred rubles in hard cash and notes besides besides my God, he could have even he couldn't even rob. All he all he could do was kill. A first attempt, I tell you, a first attempt. He lost his head and he got away not by calculation but by chance. It seems you're referring to the recent murder of the official's widow, Pyotr Petrovich put in, addressing Sosimov. He was already standing, hats, hat and gloves in the ha in hand, but wished to drop a few more clever remarks before leaving. He was obviously anxious to make a favorable impression, and vanity overcame his good sense. True. Have you heard about it? Of course, it was in the neighborhood. You know the details? I cannot say I do, but there is another circumstance in it that interests me. A whole question, so to speak. I'm not even referring to the fact that the, that crime has been increasing among the lower classes over the past five years. I'm not referring to the constant robberies and fires everywhere. What is most strange to me in this, in that crime has been increased, in that crime has been increasing among the upper classes as well. And in a parallel way, so to speak, in one place they say a former student intercepted mail on the highway. In another, people of a, people of advanced social position have been counterfeit, counterfeiting, counterfeiting banknotes. Then in Moscow, 
A whole band is caught making forged tickets for the latest lottery, and among the chief participants is a lecturer in world history. Then one of our embassy secretaries is murdered abroad for reasons mysterious and monetary. And now, if this old pawnbroker was killed by one of her clients, it follows that he is a man of higher society because peasants do not pawn gold objects. And what then? He ex explains. And what then? Explains this licentiousness. On the one hand, in the civilized part of our society, there have been many economic changes. Sazimov responded. What explains it? Radzimikin took up. It might be explained precisely by all too in inveterate impracticality. How do you mean? How do you mean that, sir? Mm. It's what your Moscow lecturer answered when he was asked why he forged lottery tickets. Everybody else is getting rich one way or another, so I wanted to get rich quickly, too. I don't remember his exact words, but the meaning was for nothing, quickly, without effort. We're used to having everything handed to us, to pulling ourselves up by other men's boots, bootstraps, to having our food chewed for us. Well, and when the great hour struck, everyone showed that he was made of... But morality, after all, the rules, so to speak. What are you so worried about? Raskolnikov broke in unexpectedly. It all went according to your theory. How according to my theory? Get to the consequences of what you've just been preaching, and it will turn out that one can go around putting a knife in people. Good God, cried Luzin. No, that's not so, echoed Sazimov. Raskolnikov was lying pale on the sofa, his upper lip trembling. He was breathing heavily. There is measure in all things, Luzin continued haughtily, and an, an, an economic idea is not yet an invitation to murder. And if one simply supposes... And is it is it true? Raskolnikov again suddenly interrupted, his voice trembling with anger, betraying a certain joy of offense. Is it true that you told your, your fiancé, at the same time as you received her consent, that above all you were glad she was poor, because it's best to take a wife wife up from destitution, so that you can lord it over her afterwards, and reproach her at, with having been her benefactor? My dear sir, losing all flushed and confused, cried out angrily and irritably, my dear sir, to distort a thought in such a fashion, excuse me, but I must tell you that rumors which have reached you, or better, which have been conveyed to you, do not have, do not have even the shadow of a reasonable foundation. And I suspect, I know, in short, this bar, your mamma, in short, even without this, seem, she seemed to me, for all her excellent qualities, incidentally, to be of a somewhat rapturous and romantic cast of mind. But all the same, I saw, I was a thousand miles from supposing that she could understand and present the situation in such a perversely fantastic form. <clears throat> and finally, finally, and do you know what? Raskolnikov cried out, raising himself on his pillow and looking point-blank at him with piercing, glittering eyes. Do you know what? What, sir? Lucin stopped and waited, with an, offend with an offended and defiant air. The silence lasted a few seconds. Just this, that if you dare, ever again, to mention my mother, even a single word, I'll send you flying down the stairs. What's got into you? cried Radzimikin. Ah, so that's how it is, sir. Lucin became pale and bit his lip. Listen to me, sir, he began distinctly, restraining himself as much as he could, but still breathless. Even earlier, for the, from the first moment, I guessed at your hostility, but I remained here on purpose to learn more. I could forgive much in a sick man and a relation, but now, you, never, sir. I am not sick, Raskolnikov cried out. So much the worse, sir. Get the hell out of here! But Luzin was already leaving on his own, without finishing his speech, again squeezing back squeezing between the table and the chair. This time, Radzimikin stood to let him pass, without looking at anyone, without even nodding to Zazimov, who for a long time had been shaking his head at him to leave the sick man alone. Luzin went out, cautiously, raising his hat to shoulder height, and ducking a little as he stepped through the door, the doorway. And even the curve of his back at the moment seemed expressive of the terrible insult he was bearing away with him. Impossible, simply impossible, the bewildered Radzimikin said shaking his head. Leave me, leave me, all of you, Raskolnikov cried out frenziedly. Will you tormentors never leave me? I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of anyone. Now, not anyone. Away from me, alone. I want to be alone, alone, alone. Come on, said Zazimov, nodding to Razumikin. Good God, can we leave him like this? Come on, Zazimov repeated insistently, and he walked out. Razumikin thought a little and ran after him. It might get worse if we don't do as he says, Zazimov added already on the stairs. He shouldn't be irritated. What is it with him? 
He needs some sort of uh, favorable push, that's all. He was strong enough today. You know, he's got something on his mind. Something fixed, heavy. That I'm very much afraid of, most assuredly. But maybe it's this gentleman, this Pyotr Petrovich. You could see from what they said that he's marrying his sister and that Rodya got a letter about it just before his illness. Yes, why the devil did he have to come now? He may have spoiled the whole thing. And did you notice that he's indifferent to every everything? Doesn't respond to anything except... For one point that drives him wild, this murder? Yes, yes, Razumikin picked up. Of course I noticed it. He gets interested, frightened. He got frightened the very day of his illness in the police chief's office. He passed out. Tell me about it in more detail this evening, and then I'll tell you a thing or two. He interests me very much so. I'll come and check on him in half an hour. There won't be any information, though. My thanks to you, and I'll... And I'll wait at Pashenka's meanwhile, and keep an eye on him through Nastasia. Raskolnikov, after they left, looked at Nastasia with impatience and anguish, but she still lingered and would not go away. Will you, will you have some tea? Will you have some tea now? She asked. Later. I want to sleep. Leave me. He turned convulsively to the wall. Nastasia went out.